Welcome to Bed Crime Stories Podcast. I'm your host, T, and this is Episode 2 of the Dietloff Incident, brought to you by Bed Crime Stories Podcast in association with Carnage Street. When last we left our hikers, they were getting ready to head out for their 16-day hiking and skiing expedition in the northern Ural Mountains, which serve as a natural boundary between the rest of Russia and the notorious region known as Siberia. As we rejoin the young adventurers, it is the evening of Friday, January 23, 1959 and they're about to head to the train station for the first leg of their long journey to the northern Ural Mountains. The next school term is set to begin in a month, and now is the time to obtain their grade three hiking certification. Nine of the hikers are gathered in dormitory room 531 at the Ural Polytechnic Institute, or UPI, in the town of Sverdlovsk. Although it's a drab space with crumbling wallpaper, lumpy mattressed beds, and an array of food odors drifting in from the nearby communal kitchen, the room is filled with lively students excited for their upcoming expedition. The hikers are busy taking care of last-minute preparations. Everyone has an assigned task. Zina is writing of the goings-on in the group's diary. The hiking group is required to document the entire journey in words and photos. Zina scrolls these words. We've forgotten salt. Igor, where are you? Where's Doroshenko? Why doesn't he take 20 packages? Will we play the mandolin on the train? Where are the scales? Damn, it doesn't fit. Who has the knife? End quote. One hiker is trying to figure out the best way to pack the bags of oats and cans of meat into the backpacks. Young Yuri Yudin is going through all the meds for the two first aid kits. Another hiker is looking for his missing leather boots. Layuda is counting all the pooled money and rolling it tightly into a waterproof metal can. Once everyone has arrived and all the work is done and the packing done, the students put on their heavily laden backpacks and walk down four flights of stairs. As they step out into the darkness, the cold January night air engulfs them. They head quickly for the tram that will carry them to the train station, which is a few miles from the campus. Twenty minutes later, they arrive at the station. They're running late, and have to make a mad dash to the entrance. Once on the train, they head to their third-class compartment. As they settle in for the train's 9.05 p.m. departure, they notice there's a foreign face among them. It's 37-year-old Alexander Zoloterov, a.k.a. Sasha. To the 20-somethings, Sasha seems, well, old. Igor makes the introductions. It's not long before the students embrace their new friend and the conversation flows freely. Somewhere along the way, Georgie pulls out his mandolin and begins to play. Sasha, the newcomer, begins to sing along. Then the whole group joins in and their impromptu jam session continues for hours. At some point, as their eyelids grow heavy, they fall asleep, all crammed in the train compartment, one head upon the other's shoulder. Ten and a half hours later, when it's time to disembark, it's still dark outside. In fact, the sun won't rise for another three hours. It is now Saturday, January 24th, 1959, and the students are in Serov, an iron and steel manufacturing town, 200 miles due north of Sverdloft. The next train due to take the hikers to the town of Ivdel isn't due to depart until later in the evening. The hikers have no choice but to wander around the unfamiliar mining town, but they're exhausted from all the travel. The late-night conversation 
an erratic sleep. Their first instinct is to slumber in the train station, but the doors to the station are still locked, and the workers inside are not in the mood to let the hikers in early. As the travelers stand on the train platform, trying to figure out their next move, Georgie pulls out his mandolin and begins to play. However, a nearby policeman isn't pleased with the sound due to the early hour. It's not yet eight o'clock. The officer, apparently irate, marches Georgie to the police station where the young hiker is scolded but eventually released. As the hikers walk in the opposite direction of the police station, down a snowy road, they come to an elementary school. It's named School Number 41. That was the Soviet way back in the day. Name buildings in remote towns with utilitarian, uninspiring names. Still desperate to catch some winks, the hikers knock on the door. A kind cleaning lady answers, and she lets them in. The schoolmaster soon shows up, and he too has a kind heart. He agrees to let the hikers rest inside an empty classroom, but in return, they're going to have to give a presentation to the class later that afternoon about their hiking expedition. Once the hikers have slept for a few hours, they head into a classroom of 35 children, ranging in age from 7 to 9. The hikers show the kids the contents of their backpacks, their maps, cameras, and flashlights, which were known as Chinese torches back then. They even pitch their six-foot by 13-foot tent for the children to see and go inside and explore. The kids end up begging to be taken along on the group's future expeditions. Sasha sings for the class, but it's the brown-eyed beauty, Zena, who the children are most enchanted with. They ask her to be their leader of the Pioneers, a youth group similar to the Scouts in the United States. In the evening, when it's time for the hikers to leave Seraph, the entire class is given permission to follow the ten hikers back to the train station. The hikers say their goodbyes to the kiddos and board the 6.30 p.m. train for Ivdel. The hikers arrive in Ivdel around midnight. They'll have a half a day to wait for the next leg of travel. As you can see when you're leaving from Sverdlovsk, a hiking excursion to the northern Urals means several days of travel by train and truck to get close to where the hikers can finally put on their skis and head out. The hikers end up spending the night in the Ivdel train station. Their bus for Vizhe is scheduled to leave at 6 a.m. on Sunday, January 25th. When it's time to get on the Soviet-made bus, they discover it only has 25 seats. And while that might sound like enough, there are other hiking groups traveling north for expeditions as well. It's not just the Dyatlov group. Some of the hikers have to actually sit atop others for the journey. The group diary describes the seating arrangement as follows. Top layer passengers sat on chairbacks with their legs on the shoulders of comrades, end quote. At a rest stop along the way, the students go into the small shop to purchase odds and ends. Once back on the bus and settled, they realize that Alexander Kolovatov is missing. Kolovatov, when he comes out of the shop and realizes his mistake, sprints to catch up with the bus. As he boards the bus out of breath and panting heavily, his eyes bulge from his head, according to Yuri Yudin. Clearly, Kolovatov was afraid he might not make it. At 2 p.m. Sunday, the bus arrives in Vizhe, or what is known as Sector 41. It's a woodcutting settlement with a school, hospital, shops, and a community center. The hikers will have to wait until the next morning to hitch a ride to the next town. Over a meal in the local cafeteria, Igor Dyatlov introduces himself and his companions to the director of the free workers' camp, 
The director takes an instant liking to the young mountaineers and offers them a place to stay at the camp's guest house. The guest house, at least to the students, has luxurious accommodations. Each member of the group gets their own room. Yuri Yudin will later describe it as the most posh house he's ever been to, a veritable mansion compared to their dorm rooms at the UPI. The students unload their backpacks, light the wood-burning stove, and prepare their dinner. After the meal, Zena sews tarpaulin covers for her boots. The covers will be made out of waterproof material, and they will tie up her leg to keep her boots and her feet inside dry. Later, some of the group members decide to head out into town to watch their favorite movie, which is called Symphony in Gold. It's an Austrian musical that was released in 1956, and it's just now getting around to the Soviet Union. It features a cast of ice skating actors performing musical numbers. Think Stars on Ice in movie format. Kolovatov and Doroshenko, however, are forced to stay back at the guest house to clean up all the dishes from dinner. They're none too happy about it. Monday, January 26. The hikers find out that the truck scheduled to head to Sector 41 won't be leaving until the afternoon. Not wanting to make breakfast because of how long it took to clean up dinner the night before, the students head to a cafeteria for breakfast where they dine on goulash and cold tea. For some reason, it's not hot, and some of the hikers are not happy about that. Next, they shop for some last-minute supplies. They then decide to seek out advice about their expedition from a local forester. In general, foresters know the roads and areas where they live very well, and they're good at advising out-of-towners on their routes. This forester invites the hikers to his home, but it's not all fun and games. He warns the hikers of the serious weather conditions where they're planning to ski and hike. After Igor tells the man of the group's plan to travel to Ortoten Mountain, the forester declares that it's a very bad idea and says it's too dangerous to head over the Ural Ridge in the winter because there are large ravines and pits where the hikers could easily fall. He also mentions winds so strong that they can blow people right off the mountain. But headstrong Igor Dyatlov insists the hikers in his group are well-prepared, are not afraid, and love a challenge. According to Yuri Yudin, Igor Dyatlov loved danger. He was one of those people who got a rush from tackling the most challenging conditions. Igor was not the type to let the forester's warnings discourage him or his group. Before leaving, Igor copied down one of the forester's maps as it was more detailed than the ones he'd brought with him. This is when Yuri Yudin began to have doubts about heading into the mountains. Although Yudin said it was because of his increasing pain in his back and legs, one has to wonder if in the back of his mind he was thinking about what the forester had said. It's unclear if all the group members heard the Forester's warnings, but you get the feeling they, like Igor Dyatlov, would have perhaps chosen a challenge over returning to the UPI without completing their expedition. In the afternoon, the ten hikers climb into the back of a truck to head to a wood-cutting settlement in Sector 41. The extreme cold and wind in the truck's open bed, combined with the bumpiness of the road, made for a miserable three-hour journey. To try to make the best of the situation, the students sing all the way. Yudin, whose rheumatism is killing him, unfurls the group's tent and uses it as a blanket. But he knows after the excruciating ride that he can't continue the journey. Beyond Sector 41, 
is where the expedition on foot will begin. And that's also where the hikers will find themselves in the desolation of the forest and the mountains. It will not be possible to turn back once they leave Sector 41. When the truck carrying the hikers arrives in Sector 41, the woodcutters living there are enchanted with the sight of the two female hikers, Zena and Layuda. Living in the isolated sector for months on end, the woodcutters likely hadn't seen females in a very long time. The woodcutters greeted the hikers, and seeing that they were not much younger than themselves, decided they wanted to help them. The head woodcutter took charge of finding rooms for the hikers. As you can well imagine, the hikers were relieved to finally get out of the freezing cold truck and into a warm space where food and beds are waiting for them. After dinner, the hikers and their new woodcutter friends sit around a wood-burning stove over cups of hot black tea. The woodcutters recite poems for the hikers. Back in the day, this is how the lonely men in isolated areas entertained themselves. There weren't any TVs. There was no internet in the region. Everything was lost in time. Only books and conversation were available for their off time. The conversation turns to love and relationships. It seems that for Zina and Layuda, these are favorite topics. And you have to wonder if they're the ones who are always bringing up these topics or if the guys are as into these topics as they are. But who in their young 20s isn't obsessed with love? The hikers sleep only a few hours that night. The next morning, on Tuesday, January 27th, Yuri Yudin makes the decision to press onward, at least to the next settlement on the itinerary. It's an abandoned geologic settlement with some abandoned cabins. Yudin is studying geology at the UPI, so he wants to see if there are any minerals or gemstones lying around the abandoned buildings. The hikers decide to wait until 4 p.m. for a Lithuanian man who's due to arrive with a horse and cart. The Lithuanian is headed to the geologic settlement to retrieve iron pipes from the abandoned village. His cart will be empty when he arrives, and while it doesn't have enough room for the hikers, the cart can carry their heavy backpacks to the geologic settlement. Because the man arrives late in the day, the hikers will have to make most of the 15-mile trek by the light of the moon. Before the sun goes down, they take photos of their first ski outing on the expedition. The photos will be needed to prove to the skiing club back home that they completed their entire expedition and followed all the rules. In some of the photos, the hikers goof around for the camera. Then they continue skiing up the frozen Lozva River, but they find that the ice is thin in areas, so they have to be very careful. They also have to stop from time to time to scrape the ice that forms on the bottom of their skis away. Yuri Yudin would later say this, The river was covered in snow, and you couldn't see the ice you were standing on. Clearly, they had to take care not to fall through the ice into the river. Already, the trek is proving difficult. Soon, the hikers find themselves engulfed in a dense forest. For nourishment along the route, they tuck into two of the four freshly baked loaves of bread they purchased that morning in Sector 41. They divide the bread equally. At some point, the adventurers pass the Lithuanian and his cart. Finally, after hours of skiing, by the light of a three-quarter moon, the students see the twenty or so snow-topped cabins. None of the cabins have candles flickering inside or smoke pouring out of their chimneys. No one lives in the settlement anymore. The skiers ski down the snowy streets past the empty cabins. Some of their windows and doors 
are blown open. There's only one cabin suitable for an overnight stay, according to the woodcutters, and Yuri Doroshenko is the first hiker to discover it when he sees a water hole cut into the ice. Here's what the hikers write in their diary for that night. We found it late at night and guessed the location of the hut only by a hole in ice. Made fire out of boards. Stove is smoking. Some of us hurt our hands on the nails. Everything's okay. And the horse arrived. And then after dinner, in a well-heated hut, we were bantering till 3 a.m. The two girls slept on the two beds. The men spread their sleeping bags on the dirty wood floor. Yuri Yudin is in terrible pain. The next morning, Wednesday, January 28th, when Yuri Yudin awakes and tries to get up, it's clear he cannot continue the expedition. From this point onward, there will be no more settlements, no more abandoned huts to sleep in. It will just be the forest and the hikers. Yudin leaves with the Lithuanian, but not before gathering pyrite and quartz minerals that he finds on the ground. Yudin had to say a quick goodbye to his friends because the Lithuanian was suddenly in a hurry. After hugs and goodbyes, Yuri leaves his friends to continue their long trek. Yudin will have to ski behind the Lithuanian because the cart is now full with iron pipes. The remaining nine hikers continue trekking upriver. They will be journeying along the Lozva River first, and later they'll head up the Ospia River, which they'll follow toward their final destination, Ortoten Mountain. Their second day on the Lozva River was similar to their first. They ski in silence for the most part. When the route becomes difficult due to thick snow, they alternate as lead skier. Each leader is in that role for 10 minutes, and then they switch. When the ice on the river gets too thin, they move over to the river bank, but the bank is steep in places, so sometimes they have to trample gingerly over the fragile ice. At some point, they come upon an existing path in the snow that has been made by skis and reindeer hooves. Those are telltale signs of manzi hunters. They also note manzi symbols painted on the trees. Symbols seem to be telling forest stories, but the hikers cannot be sure. At day's end, each member has their assigned chore to complete as they set up camp. All chores have to be completed before they can gather by the stove for dinner. They cap off the evening by listening to Georgie play the mandolin and by engaging in lively discussions that inevitably turn to love. When they get sleepy, they have to decide who will sleep where in the tent. The spot closest to the stove is the least popular, and that's because it's just way too hot. The next day, Thursday, January 29th, the group continues their trek upriver. They must have been tired that day because the entry in the group diary was short. It reads, Second day of skiing. From our night camp by the Lozva River, we took the route to the night camp along the Ospia River, along a Manzai path. Weather is fine, 13 degrees, weak wind. There is often an ice crust on the Lovzva. That's all. On Friday, January 30th, the hikers continue their journey along the Ospia River, but the weather takes a turn for the worse. The temperature drops significantly. A wind begins to howl out of the northwest, and the sky unburdens itself of giant snowflakes as if a constant stream of confetti is being shaken down on the skiers. The man's thigh track has disappeared in the snow, which is now almost four feet tall in places. This snow 
greatly slows the hiker's progress. The forest begins to disappear as well, taking with it the protection from the wind. The trees thin out, and the ones that remain are short and crooked. Despite the extreme cold, the ice on the river is still thin and unreliable. The group's diary entry for the day reads, It's impossible to go over the river. It's not frozen. Water and ice crust are under the snow, right on the ski track. So we go near the shore again. End quote. Being near the shore makes the skiing more difficult. There's stuff under the snow to navigate over. Late in the afternoon, the group stops to dine on brisket, dried bread, sugar, garlic, and coffee. Then they head back out for a few more hours of skiing. This has been the most difficult day so far, and tempers are running high. An argument takes place between Layuda and Kolya over who should stitch up the many holes in the tent. Kolya gives in at one point and takes out a needle. But there are so many holes in the tent that eventually everyone has to pitch in to get the job done. Later, the group gathers around an outdoor fire to celebrate Doroshenko's 21st birthday. His team members present him with a special gift they've been carrying with them for days, a tangerine. Back in the Soviet Union at that time, tangerines were considered rare exotic gems. Doroshenko insists on sharing the exotic fruit with his friends. The only one who doesn't partake is Layuda, because she's alone inside the tent, still miffed about the earlier tiff with Kolya. The next day, Saturday, January 31st, will prove the final one documented in the group's diary. Next time on the Dyatlov incident, we will finally arrive at the fateful day when something happens late in the night that will change the course of nine families' lives forever and perplex people for more than half a century and counting. I hope you'll join me and the hikers. Until the next time on Bed Crime Stories.